तव कथात तत्जीवन कविरीत कलमशापह श्रवण मंगल श्रीमदात भुवि गृनती So, the master with the devotees, the conversation is going on as we have seen in the last class. It's about that the realization of God. That can one see God? So that's what the devotee asks Sri Ramakrishna. Can one see God? The master's reply: Yes, surely. one can see both aspects of god god with form and without form one can see god with form the embodiment of spirit so these are the two aspects of the divine which has been uh, accept not only accepted Uh, which has been realized by sri ramakrishna through his spiritual journey and when he is speaking that yes both the aspects of god uh, are true with form and without form he is actually speaking from his realization now as we know he started his spiritual journey with with the path of devotion and ultimately we find that Tutapuri came to instruct him in the way of the Gyan, the way of the Advaita Vedanta. So he went through all the practices to at last realize the fact that the, all these practices can lead you to the spiritual illumination. And that's the thing which we find is indicated in this word that God can be seen with form and without form. so what's the path of devotion actually as we say that when we choose a deity as our chosen aspect the the deity which we choose as our chosen aspect is something which has been instructed by the guru the guru instructs that this is your chosen ideal and this is your mantra with faith a devotee starts meditating on that form of the divine and starts chanting his name and this is the thing which we find a very specific practice in hinduism in sanatan dharma that to meditate on god's form and to repeat his name uh, this practice we don't find in any other religion because most of the religion especially the as uh, as a uh, apart from hinduism doesn't believe in god with form so now this question comes is god having form so now we will find that actually it is a way which takes us to the ultimate realization which takes us beyond form and even if there is a form that form also takes us to a realization which speaks of the uh, non dual aspect of divinity the what the practice is what the way is that god with form and with name as per the various aspects of the divinity has been described in our scriptures we find there are varied forms of divinity and we will find in the modern psychology also they speak that we have many positive traits in our personality Uh, they have categorized there are 24 such positive traits uh, traits and of those 24 again they are can be uh, categorized broadly categorized 
as into six categories. The six categories in can be subdivided into 24. So these major six categories, they say that all won't be having those equal faculties, positive faculties uh, in the similar fashion. Some has the uh, preponderance of one of the quality compared to the others. Like some may have the sense of feeling of gratitude, very something uh, uh, prominent than others. Some may have the decision-making faculty very strong. Some may have the I, uh, faculty of equanimity very strong. Some may have e this compassion very strong. So all these positive qualities, we, they are all positive qualities, but they are not equally preponderant in each and every human being. Each and every human being has a preponderance of a particular one or two of those or maybe three of those uh, six major positive traits and accordingly we will find even all the divinities which has been spoken of in Hinduism they represent all those positive traits a particular divinity is uh, it represents a particular positive trait like Ganesha he represents the idea of wisdom and the faculty of taking decision. Shiva speaks of compassion. Uh, the Vishnu speaks of equanimity. The goddess Durga speaks of the valor, the strength. So like that we find that each of these various aspects of the divinity represents a particular positive trait. And this is the science which we find even in our Vedic scriptures. That the Guru will find out, will scan the personality of the disciple and what quality is preponderant in that disciple. Based on that, he will choose an ideal for him. That this is your ideal. That you are in all situations can maintain equanimity. That you are uh, having that uh, quality of Vishnu. You are extremely compassionate. You are having the com quality of Shiva. So like that, the Guru will be choosing our ideal so that our spiritual journey becomes quite spontaneous, easy. Because as per my nature, I find my ideal. And not only that, a particular form is also associated with each of this divinity. How it helps? In fact, it's a very scientific procedure. That meditation becomes very effective when we contemplate on a form associated with its name. Why? Now, our scriptures say that each and every thought has two major components. That's Nama, Rupa. That anything, I see a pot, it has a particular shape and I give it a name. This is a pot. This is a table. So there's a Nama, Rupa. So whenever I'm thinking of anything, whether it is inanimate or animate, I am actually what I'm doing. I will, I, in my mind, the name of that thing arises. Along with that, whether that form is in my, in my presence or not, in my mind, I visualize that form. The moment you are, you are not in front of a table, I say table, you have an idea. Immediately in your mind, the word table resonates and along with that the form also a some type of form is visualized by your mind though it's not in your presence so that's why they say each and every thought has two components the nama rupa now in meditation let's let us forget about the ultimate reality god what he is unless we realize we can never know what god is if i say his form he has, uh, he has, is formless. Everything is meaningless. You haven't realized these are all concepts. But why not take the help of some concept which will help me to realize the ideal in a more efficient way? What's the thing they have done? That as each and every thought has these two components, nama rupa. So when meditating, if you say God is formless and you do not take care of the form aspect of our thought. 
and just on a particular concept I am trying to meditate, you will find that the meditation is bound to be very shallow. What happens that the thought as it has two component, I have taken care of the Nama, certain concepts, I have given them certain names, but as I have not taken care of the Rupa, the mind, that, that, that aspect of the mind is now free to visualize anything and everything. So now you will find that though we are trying to meditate on God with some concept, the mind, by part, a part of the mind is busy in conceptualizing all the varied things which we come in interaction with this world. So the mind is still very much distorted, is disturbed. The, that, that type of meditation can be very mechanical because you are visualizing all sorts of things because you have not taken care of the visualization faculty and just you are taking the name, some concepts you are trying to meditate upon. So that's why we find this wonderful concept, this wonderful idea was prescribed in the, all this, our Sanatana Dharma meditation. That yes, a particular form of the divine has to be visualized and as per your temperament, that, visual, that divinity has been chosen for you, visualize that form and take its name. Now you have taken care of both the aspects of your thought, Nama, Rupa. So when you are meditating, then the meditation can really become very effective. If I am able to visualize that form and I am taking the name. So Nama, Rupa, both these aspects have been taken care of. And that way the meditation becomes effective. So at the beginning, I, as we have constantly say that maybe I don't have devotion, but if I go on repeating this process, a time comes when I develop devotion. Because that's the way the mind works. What you do repeatedly, a path is created in the mind, and once the path is created, the mind likes doing it. All our likings develop that way. So now, by constant repetition, of visualization as well as repetition of the name, a time comes when I start developing a liking for it. Now the devotion has started growing. Now more that devotion develops, the more that love develops, the more my contemplation on the divine becomes focused. The more it is focused, the more the other distractions start falling off. So how it takes us to the realization? that the last thing to fall off, even if the meditation is extremely intense, the last thing to fall off is our ego. The idea that I am this limited body-mind complex. A part of my mind is always associated with that. But when the meditation becomes really intense, that ego also falls off. And that's where our scriptures say that you enter into the state of Samadhi, which has been defined as a state where the Triputi Bheda happens. Triputi Bheda means the triad, the triad of Dhyana, Dhyata, Dhyaya. That when I am meditating, how focused I may be, I am aware of three things. That the meditator, that I am meditating, I am the meditator, the object of meditation, my Ishta, and the process of meditation. So this three triad still exists. A time comes when the ego also has been obliterated because my mind is so focused that even to process that ego, the mind has uh, no such capacity because it is totally focused on the object of meditation. It cannot in any way process any other information. And at last, even that small bit of mind which is required to keep your ego intact, that also has been taken away by our object of meditation. And then what happens? This the triad collapses. The dhyana, dhyata, this distinction falls off and you become one with the object of meditation. And in all the scriptures we'll find that when you become one with the object of meditation, then what happens? That you develop that idea, immediately that conviction comes that God alone exists. This idea of the duality has fallen off. You, me has fallen off. 
because in meditation you have become one with the object of meditation when it has happened when the ego has obliterated and it takes us to a state where i find that idea of non duality that god alone exists when you come down from that state then you find from god alone the everything else has been projected so now this is the idea which sri ramakrishna explains in a very simple way in some other context in some other portion of the gospel of sri ramakrishna in uh, of yeah in the gospel what is saying that our ego is just like a wall which doesn't allow us to see the reality which is beyond the wall all our spiritual practices are like chiseling on that wall of ego that if you are a worshipper of krishna you are as if chiseling your visualization taking the name is like chiseling on the wall of ego and a time comes this chiseling is still visualization a time comes when you reach the state of samadhi ego has obliterated you have as if created a hole in the wall of ego but the hole is in the form of krishna which you were meditating that's the framework now through that you peep to see what's the, there on the other side what's the reality beyond the ego and then sri ramakrishna is saying in a simple words that you make a hole in the wall peep through it and you see infinite expanse nothing else exists that alone exists now as we have made a framework in the form of krishna so i what i start saying krishna is infinite because that's the framework through which i am peeping into the infinite expanse so krishna is infinite the one who has made a hole in the form of rama he says rama is infinite he is the ultimate reality one who made it in the form of uh, jesus or in the form of uh, any other concept of divinity whether it is ganesha shiva vishnu uh, or any concept of the uh, devi the feminine aspect of the divine whatever it may be that becomes the ultimate reality so now we will find through devotion we do re- relate to that infinite dimension spiritual dimension of our existence through a particular framework and that sometimes leads to a type of fanaticism as i have made a whole i have i'm relating to the uh, infinite dimension of my existence to a particular framework that becomes the be all and end all of my idea of the ultimate reality so that's why a shiva bhakta will say shiva is ultimate a vishnu bhakta will say vishnu is ultimate reality a devi bhakta will say that devi that whether it is durga or kali whatever is the ultimate reality because all have done what have they have created a hole in the wall of ego that framework through which they have peeped to the same infinite expanse infinite dimension of our existence and that framework becomes the ultimate be all and end all of this our existence see what sri ramakrishna did that as he was extremely curious to practice all the ways through all the paths he wanted to find out that what's the whether all the paths are true that so many different uh, um, <coughs> denominations of religions are there they all speak that the ultimate reality is as per the denomination the aspect of the chosen ideal which is the ideal for that particular path that's the ultimate goal everyone says that then what's the reality and then by following all the paths at last he found all the paths lead to the same goal that 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 framework through which you are peeping you are peeping to the same infinite dimension and that's how he came to that idea that if spirituality is not a matter of faith if it's a, if it's a intense yearning to know the reality with that you approach spirituality and then it will take you to that ultimate reality where all the path leads to that same goal jato mot tato path all will take you to that realization and that's non dual realization which has been spoken of so through the form you realize the ultimate dimension of your existence and the one who has who is a gyani who doesn't take any form what he is doing he has created also through he has also through meditation created a particular mental module what's that that 
I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses. I am the ultimate reality, the Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. So this mental module is something which is contradicting the idea of ego. The ego which is the hub of our personality with which all mental modules are linked. Everything is linked with that mental module. Now, you, what you are doing, you are hammering that ego. With, you have created a mental, it's like Kalidasa, sitting on the branch, cutting the same branch. A Gyanin's path is almost like the same. The mind, the mind which is not Brahman, with the help of that you are constantly denying that I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses. I am Brahman. Who is saying? The mind is saying. And this mental module is like cutting the same branch on which you are sitting. You have created a module and then you are trying to uh, disassociate yourself from that ego. You are hammering out the ego. And when you really succeed in doing that, all the mental modules collapses at a time and again the same way it takes you to that ultimate reality. So without form also it is possible. Though the process is a bit different, but it is taking you to that absolute reality that way also. Sri Ramakrishna went to that non-dual path ultimately at the last Tottapuri came. So he could easily relate to the fact that the form, the true form, the meditation through form meditation, the way you go to relate to that ultimate reality the same way, even without form, you relate to that ultimate reality. Though the process may be a bit different, but at last it takes you to that goal, that uh, that unitary experience. So that's why whether it's God with form or without form. Both takes you that when I start my journey with whatever the, my faith may be, at last it takes us to that realization. The one who has taken the form for him, that form becomes the ultimate reality. Those who have not taken the form, that formless aspect takes relates to the ultimate reality, but both takes them to that unitary experience. If you are going through the path of jnana, then your ultimate experience is yatra yatra mano yatri tatra tatra param padam drishyate. You see that ultimate reality wherever my mind goes. And those who are a devotee for them, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the same thing. But he is saying the same, having the same unitary experience, but instead of that non-dual conscious principle, he is seeing his deity everywhere. Jatra jatra netra pare, tatra tatra krishna spure. That wherever my vision goes, I see Krishna popping out from the entire existence. So it is the same unitary experience, whether it is with form or without form. It takes you to that ultimate reality which speaks of that unitary experience. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating. So now, the next what he is saying, after saying that God can be realized both with form and without form, now he is relating to the avatara aspect, the aspect of God's descent to this earth in the human form as a divine incarnation. So that way also we can realize God. We can see God in the human form, in a tangible form. That also Sri Ramakrishna is asserting in his successive, in his following conversation. What he's saying? Again, God can be directly perceived in a man with a tangible form. Seeing an incarnation of God is the same as seeing God himself. God is born on earth as man in every age. So this is the idea, even in Bhagavad Gita we see, find, that it is by our own effort to realize the ultimate reality is very difficult. In the 14th verse of the 7th chapter, Bhagavan in Gita is saying, what is saying? Daivi hesha gunamai mama maya duratyaya mame vaya prapadyante mayam etam tarantite that the Lord has created this world which is constituted of the three gunas and that deludes us sattva rajastamas that for the stimuli it generates some visualization and that visualization ends up in a particular response so the stimuli response conditioning which is uh, the characteristic of each and every living being that's how 
we have got entangled in this world of phenomenal existence that we are responding to the stimuli and that speaks of our entanglement in this world of this phenomenal existence this gunamai maya so in that we are all entangled to to surpass that to go beyond that is something almost impossible the only it is how is it possible the one who resorts to that spiritual journey by refuging taking refuge uh, to the divine by surrendering to the lord that's mameva ye prapadyante mayam etam taran so, so by taking refuge to the divine so just whether it is with form or the formless aspect in whatever form a particular person feels the temperament he resorts to that and by that alone he can really relate to that ultimate reality but it is not easy it is duratya it is very difficult that's why god out of compassion he comes he, he descends on this earth in the human form that's again has been indicated in bhagavad gita in the fourth chapter the sixth verse what it says ajopi san avyayatma bhutanam ishwaropi san prakriti swam adhishthaya sambhavami atma mayaya so this two aspects of maya one is guna maya and one is the atma maya guna maya is the maya with which we are entangled but god also resorts to the same maya and he comes down in the human form and that aspect of maya is called atma maya what is the difference guna maya is something which enforces us to trans transmigrate we are almost forced enchained by it but atma maya is just the free will of the lord out of compassion he imposes upon himself that atma maya and takes the human form comes down why he comes down so that holding unto him we can rise up so his avatarana is for our ascendance so that's the idea in bhagavad gita that sri ramakrishna very nicely explains suppose you have uh, fallen in a river and you are drowning uh, and now you're about to die you're suffocating and suddenly someone realizes that yes so uh, that someone has drowned so immediately they throw a chain on the water and you take hold of the chain and by holding onto the rungs of the chain gradually you will get up and save yourself so sri ramakrishna is saying that god is has done the same thing that we are drowned in this worldliness he as the chain comes down avatarana so that we can hold on to him and rise up so this chain is as if like his leela each and every rung of his chain each and every joint of his chain are the leela holding on to which his divine play holding on to which we can ascend to the spiritual dimension of our existence because his life is something which is daivi which is divya where you will find that each and every aspect of his life is in the is uh, like an index finger if you just try to contemplate on each and every aspect of life you will find that though he is in the human form but his way of life speaks of something which is beyond all the limitations of our human existence that he can transcend all the so called limitations of the human existence which we have he somehow can transcend though he appears as human so this play of the divine and the human in the human body that goes on sometimes he appears to be just like a human being and again the next moment he appears to be something beyond this our phenomenal existence and that's the personality which attracts us and then by holding on to that personality through awe through devotion gradually we also get transformed the transformation starts as sri ramakrishna in the gospel says that it, it's actually an idea in the upanishads that a a, ty- a particular type of insect contemplating on some other insect becomes that actually what uh, it's not the fact that in uh, in some some of the insect in its nest it creates the nest in such a way that other insect gets captured there 
and most probably it feeds on them. So people see that particular insect entering, but it never sees it coming out. What it comes out is the insect which has built the net. That only comes out. So that gives an idea. The insect which has entered, it has as if by its association with the host insect has become that, has transformed. So that's why he used to say that it is from the idea of the Vedas. By contemplating on something, you become that. So that's the idea is in the Bhakti Shastra also. That by, when the divine comes down, takes the human form, and in his life there is an interplay of the human and the superhuman uh, aspect of his divine existence. And that allures us, that creates a sense of awe from which a devotion, that we all want to transcend our limitations. That's, that's something which is within all of, each and every one of us. So we all want to transcend. That inspires us. And that leads to that contemplation of the divine, leading ultimately to that emancipation, spiritual emancipation. So that's ajopi sanna vyatma. That though I am the absolute reality of vyaya, beyond any uh, form of manifestation or change or transformation, I am the absolute reality. I am the Avyatma, that is undecaying reality. Bhutanam Ishwarapisan, though I am the Lord of the entire existence, because the entire existence has come out of me, but still, out of compassion, I do descend. From ages, from age to age, I descend, take the human form, so that holding unto me, they can ascend, they can ascend to the spiritual dimension of their existence. So that's the thing which is spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita. That's the idea Yes, Sri Ramakrishna is also indicating. That it's not only that we're meditating on God with form or formless aspect of divinity, but we go to that realization. So from time to time, God incarnates. And the fortunate ones, by relating to that divine incarnation, by uh, it's not possible for all to realize the divine in human form. Many take him to be an ordinary human being, or human human being, as in the Bhagavad Gita. It has been indicated that uh, that many this what is this is uh, many will be uh, relating to the divine. How that they take him to be an ordinary human being. This avajananti mang mura manushing tanumasritam parang bhavam ajananta mama bhuta maheshwaram. But most of us will be taking me as an ordinary human being. They are the murha. They are the deluded one. They don't. They think him to be a just an embodied being like any other person. They can never realize the divine aspect. This param bhavam ajananta mama bhuta. That I am the Maheshwara. I am the Lord of the entire bhuta, of this entire existence. Bhuta means what? Anything that is born is bhuta. God is beyond birth. Anything is born. The bhudhatu means to take birth. The bhuta means anything that takes birth. In this world, everything is bhuta. Everything is bhuta because they were born at a certain point of time. There was a cause for which it was born. But God is beyond all cause. He is the ultimate existence who exists by its own right. So that's why he is a bhuta maheshwara. He is beyond this world of bhuta. So he descends. But most of us don't realize. It is only the fortunate ones who do realize the divine who has taken the form of human being and they are blessed just with the naked eyes as if they are seeing the divine and very easily they can you will find that whenever there is a divine incarnation their associates very easily in one life as if can traverse the entire spiritual journey very intense spiritual journey and lead that per- and meet and uh, uh, achieve that perfection which most probably would have taken births together if it was by their own effort and that's the thing Sri Ramakrishna is indicating here that he do takes uh, that it is uh, again God can be perceived directly in a man with a tangible form seeing an incarnation of God is the same as seeing God himself God is born on earth as man in every age now, it was Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, so 11th March 1883. So, 
now the uh, description starts of the, on that date so it was sri ramakrishna's birthday many of his disciples and devotees wanted to celebrate the happy occasion at the dakshineshwar temple garden from early morning the devotees streamed in alone or in parties after the morning worship in the temples sweet music was played in the nahabat it was spring time the trees creepers and plants were covered with new leaves and blossoms the very air seemed laden with joy and the hearts of the devotees were glad on this auspicious day m arrived early in the morning and found the master talking smilingly to bhavanath rakhal and kali krishna m prostrated uh, himself before him master to m i am glad you have come to the devotees one cannot be spiritual as long as one has shame hatred or fear so it's actually a very nice uh, uh, the spun of words which sri ramakrishna used to uh, play play with these words uh, in bengali it's very nice that lajja ghrina bhoy tin thakte noy lajja is shame ghrina is hatred fear as long as you have these three you cannot think of attaining spiritual perfection so one cannot be spiritual as long one has shame hatred or fear great will be great will be the joy today but those fools who will not sing or dance mad with god's name will never attain god how can one feel any shame or fear when the names of gods are sung now sing all of you so that's how he is inspiring so sometimes we find that we feel ashamed uh, the oh i am a gentleman how can i just just simply get up and start dancing in front of all so sri ramakrishna is saying such shame is detrimental for our spiritual journey that why he is saying so that why shame is detrimental now i will find what's the root cause of shame it is extreme self consciousness isn't it that when we are extremely self conscious then only the shame comes to existence so and for our spiritual journey the more i am conscious of this limited existence the more my ego is saturated the more i am far away from the spiritual goal so this self consciousness has to fall off and shame is the hindrance that way while taking god's name what others will think of me this who of who, what others will think of me this limited me that's the self consciousness which doesn't allow you to get totally absorbed in the thought of the divine so that's why it's an hindrance as sri ramakrishna used to say when shall i be free when i cease to be and i can never cease when you are feeling ashamed that speaks that you are extremely self conscious the self this self is not the ultimate self this limited self is too conscious of it to give an example you will find in the life of holy mother to follow the social norms she always had a huge a long veil no one could see her face even sri ramakrishna most probably throughout his life there were very few occasions there would have been where he could have seen holy mother's face his own wife's face he could have never seen he would have never seen because such a long veil she had but one day at night one of the disciples of ramakrishna was out he was going towards the nahabat uh, uh, he was going towards the uh, pine grove and he had to cross the nahabat where holy mother used to stay it was a full moon night at night holy mother knew that most probably that uh, that's the time and uh, all has gone to sleep no one is moving out so in the hot sultry weather to s- sit inside the room sometimes you know is very uncomfortable she was sitting just in the veranda in front of her small room and in the full moon night in the night she was meditating and she was so absorbed in meditation the one who could never see her face because of the long veil now she has lost total she was so oblivious of the surrounding all shots of self consciousness there is no question he is totally absorbed in the divine 
the veil has fallen off. Her face could be seen in the moonlit night. And Yogananda was highly impressed seeing that. That how it is possible that a lady with such shyness, when she is thinking of the divine, the veil has fallen off. She is not aware of her body as if. She has got so much absorbed in the divine. So now you will find that for the real absorption, the shame do becomes a hindrance, a factor which hinders. So you have to get rid of the shame. You see a small child, a small child, unless the elders, the parents make him dress, it is not bothered about the dress. It will be moving around without any dress, naked. Why? Because the child is not aware of his body. That speaks of the purity. The lesser we have the uh, awareness of our body, the more pure we are. When Swami Vivekananda returned from the West along with the Western devotees, all the Western ladies were with Swamiji traveling uh, throughout India. In one of the railway station, these ladies uh, who were uh, in uh, company of Swami Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda was also with them. So these ladies suddenly got horrified seeing the Naga sadhus. You know, they all moved na uh, this naked and they shouted uh, in disgust that how can someone in public place move about naked? And Swamiji immediately asked them to stop, scolded them vehemently, that don't judge the, some other civilization from the background of your culture. In your culture, nudity is a science of expression of beauty. You want to show, you are too much self-conscious and you want to show the world how beautiful you are and that entails in nudity and here the idea is a small is this the sadhus are so absorbed in the divine that they are not aware of their body they're like small child so that's why the dress whether it is there or not they are totally oblivious of it they are like a small child pure there's no sense of body so that speaks of the idea that as long as you have shame there cannot be that higher spiritual absorption. For Sri Ramakrishna in his own life, you will find it was so difficult for him to keep his clothes intact. It used to fall off. There is a very funny story. One day he went to a Brahmo Samaj uh, congregation. And after the congregation, uh, they gave him some food, some refreshment. Sri Ramakrishna was just sitting and having the food and then he was bragging. He was bragging to the other, the members who were all surrounding him. That what he was saying, that previously I never, I had, I, I used to lose my body consciousness so much that I couldn't take care of my clothes. But now it is a bit better. I, I can somehow uh, uh, just keep my clothes intact. When he was saying that, you know, sometimes the small children you know, if they are wearing something loose, they will be just trying to pull up the pants. So, Sri Ramakrishna was pulling up the dhoti when he was saying that. And suddenly there was a huge laughter from behind the screens. In, this day, in those days, the ladies never used to come out uh, in the presence of others in the congregation. But to enjoy whatever is going on, to just see, witness what's going on in the congregation, there was a purda system. There's, there used to be the screen from behind which they could see what's going on, but the others cannot see that uh, them, being, they being behind the screen. So that was the, how the screens were made. So now these ladies who were behind the screens, they could see what's going on there. Ramakrishna bragging that I, I nowadays I'm a bit conscious and now he has pulled up his dhoti so much that yes, he was almost virtually naked. And that's why there was a roll of laughter so that was his condition. He was he couldn't he was totally unaware. You will find in the gospel when you read so many places it is mentioned that when he is fully absorbed uh, uh, in, uh, with the divine f this fervor, singing, dancing, when the cloth has opened has fallen, he is not aware at all. So that speaks of going beyond shame. That's why he's saying that as long as you have shame, you cannot have that uh, the ultimate divine absorption. 
because you are very much conscious about this limited personality. So that's why there's that shame, hatred. So hatred, you know, that, that if you have a sense of hatred for what? For any holy person that you'll find that it happens with most of us. I don't know a <coughs> so-called a sadhu or someone, a holy person. <coughs> Suddenly I see him. For most of the people, the first reaction, oh, he most probably he is a humbug. What I have done, I have actually polluted my own mind. He was just a suggestion. I don't know what type of personality he is. But the moment seeing him, I think he must be he must be a humbug. I am contemplating on something negative. That spirituality is something and uh, an, a lofty ideal which is not practiced by anyone. Anyone who is taking the garb of a religious man must be a humbug. And that's what I am contemplating. And what we contemplate, that we become, that we are. That our bhava leads to our transformation of the nature. What you are thinking, that you become. So instead of hating by thinking all sorts of negative ideas about a holy person, if I would have I would have such faith, the sraddha, oh, he must be a holy man. He represents the culture of renunciation, renouncing everything for God. He has taken the garb of a sannyasin. What would have it done? The person is just a mere suggestion. What he is, I don't know. But by relating to that dress in a total different way, I am, I am just contemplating on the positive aspects of our life. Renunciation, spirituality, that's what I'm contemplating. And that's the thing which speaks of my contemplation leading to spiritual perfection. Because again the same thing, what you are meditating, that you become. So just you see that in our life, if constantly we go on hating, whenever we see any religious aspects, we hate, we are harming ourselves. That person remains as it is. Nothing is changing. Actually, it is not the fact. If you respect, both are benefited. Seeing a holy man, when you show respect, it is you who are benefited by your own positive thought and that person also is benefited. That when someone bows down to him, shows respect, immediately he feels a sense of responsibility. That why is bowing down to me? Why is showing respect? That I represent something. So my life should be as per what I represent. So that reminds him of his ideal. That way it helps him too. So, if, so in, in every way you will find hatred is a cause of degeneration for both and <coughs> respect the opposite to it. <coughs> that again is the cause of evolution of both the one who is respecting as well the one who is being respected. So now we have to decide that way. So we'll find that hatred can never lead us to the spiritual ideal. The, sh the shame, the hatred, and the fear. So if I have fear, that speaks there is no love. The sign of love is absence of fear. Swami Vivekananda gives a very nice example. He says, just think of a young mother passing down the street. She is alone. She is passing down the street. She is a young lady. And <clears throat> from a distance she hears the barking of a dog. And she is so scared. She runs. The same lady, the next day she is holding a child. Today she is the mother. She is holding the child. The child is with him. Swamiji is saying a very nice thing. What to speak of the barking of a dog? If a lion comes in front of her, today she will be facing the lion, guarding, guarding the child. From where she got that courage? Love, nothing else. So if I really have that love for God, the fear that what others will think of me when I chant the name of God, whether they will criticize me, whether they will think I am mad, I am a lunatic person, having all these sorts of uh, vague ideas. 
and that's what it speaks of it speaks that i don't have the real love for the divine if i had a real love that would have given me sufficient courage where love is there cannot be any fear so now you will understand that why sri ramakrishna said that in spiritual life the shame hatred fear unless uh, as long as you have this that seeing a holy man i feel some hatred or any holy place i have an aversion i can never progress in spiritual life that faith that respect should be there that love should be there i should not feel shame ashamed to be in association with that i shouldn't be afraid so these are the things which speaks of the spiritual evolution i have to get rid of them so that's what sri ramakrishna is saying that unless that one can get rid of shame hatred fear lajja ghrina bhoy tin thakte noy so uh, those are the fools who will not sing that there's such so much of singing dancing will go on on the uh, on the occasion of sri ramakrishna's birthday so whoever will feel free to join in that congregation they are blessed those who are feeling ashamed not joining so they cannot relate to that intense divine fervor which others will be experience he cannot relate to that so that's the thing sri ramakrishna is indicating through these words this is to encourage all to just renounce this uh, shame hatred and fear and get absorbed in this this divine congregation uh, this is the divine song divine uh, dance all this this in this congregation whatever is going on to get involved sri ramakrishna is en- 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 encouraging them with these words after this we find that bhavanath one of the devotees and his friend kali krishna they start singing a song what's that song it's i'm just uh, not reading the entire song a small portion thrice blessed blessed is this day of joy may all of us unite o lord to preach thy true religion to thee the victory o lord to thee the victory so it's a long song just the short portion i le- i am just reading as sri ramakrishna listened to the song with folded hands his mind soared to a far off realm he remained absorbed in meditation a long time after a while kali krishna whispered something to bhavanath then he bowed before the master and rose sri ramakrishna was surprised he asked where are you going so this kali krishna had to leave because he had some other work bhavanath he is going away on a little business master what is it about bhavanath is going to the baranagar working men's institute master it's his bad luck a stream of bliss will flow here today he could have enjoyed it but how unlucky so as <coughs> in one of the pur- puranas <coughs> very nicely it has been said tat dinam durdinam manye megha channa na durdinam yad dinam krishna sanglap katha piyusha varjitam <coughs> so we generally say oh today is very cloudy the weather is very dull uh, the, today it's a very boring day so the purana is saying that no that 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 type of day is not a a, a boring day or a bad day the real uh, evil day is the day in which we somehow forget to take the name of the lord to repeat the nectar of the lord's name to <coughs> drink the nectar of lord's name this yat dinam krishna sanglap katha piyush varjitam this krishna katha sanglap the discussion on this the life of the divine of krishna that is the piyush this like nectar when you are devoid of that that's a bad day and that's what sri ramakrishna is saying it's of course a bad luck for him that today is so much of divine this uh in this divine congregation so much of divine intoxication will be there singing dancing all will be enjoying this divine congregation he for some reason cannot be here and that's why it's of course a bad luck for him so that's what sri ramakrishna is indicating sri ramakrishna did not feel well so he decided not to bathe in the ganges about 9 o'clock a few jars of water were taken from the river and with the help of the devotees he finished his bath on the veranda east of his room 
the master when the went with the devotees to the northeast veranda of his room among them was a householder from the village of dakshineshwar who studied vedanta philosophy at home he had been discussing om with kedar before the master he said this eternal word the anahata shabd is ever present both within and without so this is the concept that the ultimate reality its vachaka is om it is called anahata shabd anahata the you know this very this words are very important what anahata means now to for create any sound there should be a collision without collision there cannot be any sound <clears throat> just trying to clap the sound of the clap you call this clap two hands one hands collides with the other that creates the sound can there be any sound without collision that cannot be but when the ultimate re- from this ultimate reality this universe is being projected that ultimate reality is being projected as the shakti now any form of shakti is a vibration that speaks of the sound you just uh, hit a gong what happens when you hit the gong that the sound will be vibrating it starts spreading it's not lost it is just dissipating it's going everywhere even in modern science this uh, the, uh, sometimes we find that these words are so interesting that's they speak of the big bang from which the entire creation came and now how you know how know this how this big bang was proven that it really has happened that previously it was just a theory but uh, two scientists got nobel prize because they could detect that that big bang really happened one of them was penzias the other scientist i forgot they were cleansing the uh, this in the hubble telis- this uh, the, this telescope uh, and th- still after cleaning they found that there is some noise it was not focused to any particular galaxy or star there was having some noise just generally which is they get such detection whenever it is focused so they thought most probably it must be some birds dropping that the heat of that has created some uh, some waves some vibrations so thinking that they went uh, to clean the antenna they found no it's clean it's there is nothing is there and then they at last came to the conclusion that this is the remnant of the big bang the remnant just when you beat a gong that the sound is never lost it just goes on dissipating it may be inaudible but it is there the big bang was something It's, it was of infinite dimension, tremendous, an almost dimension. So that's the remnant of it is still there in the universe. When I open the TV, when it is not uh, tuned to any particular channel, you see that the that the hazy noise and the all the uh, points jumping. It's not the entire thing. There is lot of other noise too. In that, a portion of the remnant is also there. So they say it is always there in the universe. a very interesting from that they also got the nobel prize that it can be detected that the remnant of the big bang just like the way you when you hit the gong the sound never is lost it starts propagating though it may be inaudible but it's still there so this remnants of the big bang is still there it can be detected a very interesting when the creation happened at that time before the big bang there was no matter there was no matter there was no nothing called matter it was just an what you say that you can say that bang uh, is something of an energy so energy which later after that after the big bang the matter started evolving now how this term this term is very important anahata now any sound is possible only when the matter collides with matter but this is the vibration if in its beginning there was no matter there is no question of collision so this is a sound is the only sound is the only vibration which can be anahata that without any collision so in the vedic this uh, that's why we sometimes say these terms itself are very very interesting very interesting this as the science of the remnant of the big bang is always there in the universe everywhere the yogis will 
somehow could relate to that uh, without an instrument, whatever it may be the form. And that's the idea of the Anahata Dhvani. It is there permeating the entire universe. That sound is always there. And that's the thing is in the scriptures and that's the what the devotee has read and that's what he's saying. What he's saying that uh, the eternal word, the Nahata Shabda is ever present both within and without. Since it is permeating the entire universe. Sri Ramakrishna's reply is something very significant. Uh, that's the thing, uh, we will just uh, read that his reply. But what it signifies? That we will try to discuss again in the next class. The master, but the word is not enough. There must be something indicated by the word. Can your name alone make me happy? Complete happiness is not possible for me unless I see you. So whenever there is a name, something must be representing that name. So when that Shabda, the first sound happened, if I say that's to be the ultimate reality, then I am missing out something, that something is being finding expression as this uh, energy. That as in the, our uh, scriptures they say this Brahma Shakti, this Brahma is finding expression as Shakti. The something must be beyond that. How can just a name be there without something, a substance? If something has to be named, then only the name comes to existence. So what actually Sri Ramakrishna is trying to indicate? that. Don't take the Om to be the ultimate reality. The, this Om is representing something. That sound is just like a flower. The fragrance cannot be there. The flower and its fragrance. They are inseparable. I cannot think of the fragrance of the flower without the flower. They are inseparable. I cannot think of the heat of the fire without the fire. Agni, Dahika, Shakti. Similarly, the name, Naam, Nami. There should be something which is finding expression as this energy, as this Shabda, as this Anahata Dhvani. So that, don't forget about that. That you have to realize. And that's the thing Sri Ramakrishna is indicating. <coughs> he is giving just a hint. He will continue with his discussion uh, again in the, succeeding, uh, in the following paragraphs, which we will take up in the next class and try to have a discussion on what Sri Ramakrishna is trying to say when he is saying that the word is not enough. There must be something indicated by the word. Can your name alone make me happy? Complete happiness is not possible for me unless I see you. So with this, we uh, conclude our uh, discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskars.